welcome to Insight Ophthalmology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to the continuation of Anatomy of Orbit. Today we are studying the various foramina and fissures which are present in the orbit and the contents which are passing through them. Before we start, just a basic difference between foramina and fissures. A foramina is a circular opening in the orbit, whereas a fissure is referred to an opening which is slightly elongated. Example, the superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure. So what are the four main openings in the orbit that we are going to talk about in this video? We shall be discussing about the superior orbital fissure and its contents the inferior orbital fissure and its contents, the ethmoidal foramina, and the optic canal. Now first let us talk about the superior orbital fissure. In my previous video on the anatomy of orbit, I already described the superior orbital fissure as an elongated opening as you can see over here which is present between the lateral wall of the orbit and the roof of the orbit. Now the, the lateral wall of the orbit if you would remember is actually formed by the zygomatic bone and the greater wing of the sphenoid. So if you see here the greater wing of the sphenoid on one side and the lesser wing of the sphenoid on the other side they are going to harbor what is called the superior orbital fissure already know that there are four important recti muscles present in the eye and these are the superior rectus the inferior rectus the medial rectus and the lateral rectus these four recti take origin from a ring which is actually attached onto the superior orbital fissure and this ring is called the common tendinous ring because it is serving as a common tendinous origin of the four recti muscle in the eye this ring is also called the annulus of zinn this ring is attached on the superior orbital fissure as you can see in such a manner that it is actually dividing the superior orbital fissure into a superior compartment or an upper compartment which is the part of the superior orbital fissure above the level of the common tendinous ring. And then we have a middle compartment which is the compartment of the superior orbital fissure within the limits of the common tendinous ring and an inferior compartment or the lower compartment which is present below the level of the annulus of Zinn. Now let us talk about the various contents of the superior orbital fissure. First we shall discuss about the upper compartment or the superior compartment of the SOF or superior orbital fissure. The superior orbital uh, fissure compart uh, compartment or superior compartment basically has the uh, three nerves and these three nerves can be remembered with the mnemonic of LFT. Okay, you know it's also an acronym used for liver function test. So LFT is a mnemonic to remember that through the superior orbital fissure what passes is the lacrimal nerve which stands with L. Then we have the frontal nerve and then we have one more cranial nerve which is the trochlear nerve. Okay, now here if you would remember from the anatomy of the trigeminal nerve, the trigeminal nerve and its first division is the ophthalmic division. So that is represented as V1. Okay, V is the fifth division that is the, tri uh, the fifth cranial nerve that is the trigeminal nerve and one refers to the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. So the lacrimal nerve and the frontal nerve, they are the branches of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. The trochlear nerve is the fourth cranial nerve and then one more structure which is represented here in blue is the superior ophthalmic vein which passes through the superior compartment of the superior orbital fissure. Now what are the structures which pass through the middle compartment of the superior orbital fissure? We, the, the structures which are passing are basically the nerves. So we have basically the third cranial nerve and we know that the third cranial nerve has two divisions, the superior division and the inferior division. So both these divisions are going to pass through the uh, middle compartment of the superior orbital fissure. So this is represented as here by the letter 3 okay by the number three then there's another uh, cranial nerve which passes in between the superior and the inferior division of the third nerve and that is the abducent nerve which is the cranial number six okay and there's one more branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve which is passing through the middle compartment and that is the nasociliary nerve so a mnemonic to remember that is the nose is present basically in between or in center of our eyes and therefore the nasociliary nerve or the nasociliary branch of the trigeminal nerve also passes through the middle compartment of the superior orbital fissure 
Now what about the inferior compartment of the superior orbital fissure? The inferior compartment is very simple to remember. The only vein which is passing is the inferior ophthalmic vein. Now here I want uh, to draw your attention towards a point that the trigeminal nerve is the fifth cranial nerve and the trigeminal nerve actually has three divisions, the ophthalmic division, the maxillary division and the mandibular division which are represented as V1, V2 and V3. The ophthalmic division has three branches and all the three branches are passing through the orbit okay and they're going towards the eye and therefore it is called the ophthalmic division. Now the three branches are the lacrimal nerve, the frontal nerve and the nasociliary branch. The lacrimal branch and the frontal branch if you would remember I told you they are passing through the superior compartment of the superior orbital fissure whereas the nasociliary branch will be passing through the center compartment of the superior orbital fissure. The maxillary division does not pass through the orbit and the mandibular division also does not pass through the orbit. Now another fissure is now the inferior orbital fissure. The inferior orbital fissure as you can see over here is present between the lateral wall of the orbit and the inferior wall of the orbit and that elongated structure is called the inferior orbital fissure. In the second picture again you can see that the top view of the inferior orbital fissure you can see here the major chunk is formed uh, uh, the major boundary is formed by the maxillary bone and the palatine bone is also forming a part of its boundary. Now as I told you the trigeminal nerve first division that is the ophthalmic division passes through the orbit straight away through the superior orbital fissure. The maxillary division does not pass through the superior orbital fissure and it does not straight away comes into the orbit. It has some course through the pterygopalatine fossa and then it enters the inferior orbital fissure as an inferior orbital nerve, right? So to understand the contents of the inferior orbital fissure, it is very important for us to understand the course of this maxillary division that is V2 of the trigeminal nerve. To understand that, you should understand uh, one very basic principle and that is this is a sphenoid bone. Okay, and I told you that this is the greater wing of sphenoid, this is the lesser wing of sphenoid and this is the body of the sphenoid and this is the pterygoid processes of the sphenoid. Okay, so what are these? These are the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone, right? Now, if you would identify this is the orbit. And what is the bone over here? This is the maxillary bone which is harboring the maxillary sinus. And this is the location where you are going to find the uh, pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. So there is a fossa or a space in the form of an inverted triangle present between the orbital apex above, the pterygoid process behind and the maxillary bone in front and this inverted pyramidal fossa or space or cavity is called the pterygopalatine fossa. This pterygopalatine fossa is very important for us to understand the course of the trigeminal uh, maxillary division. So what happens over here is that the V2 division which is the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve it does not enter into the orbit straight away. As you can see over here it is not entering through the superior orbital fissure. This is the V1 division. The V1 division has decided to go to the superior orbital fissure. However the V2 division has to come somehow into the orbit but it does not come straight away through the inferior orbital fissure. Okay, so it enters from the skull first into the pterygopalatine fossa which is situated here and the opening that it uses in the skull is called the foramen rotundum. Okay, so through that foramen rotundum it enters into the pterygopalatine fossa. Over there it gives a branch to the zygomatic or to the cheek and that is called the zygomatic nerve and once the maxillary division that is uh, the V2 has given the zygomatic branch now it will form what is called the infraorbital nerve okay so this is called the infraorbital nerve so as the name itself suggests infra means inferior orbit means orbit so it is in the inferior aspect of the orbit of the orbit. So this infraorbital nerve is then going to enter the inferior orbital fissure and then it's going to travel in the inferior orbital groove. So uh, this is uh, the summary of what I explained to you just now. The maxillary nerve exits the skull through the foramen rotundum 
and then it travels through the pterygopalatine fossa and finally enters the orbit at the infraorbital fissure and travels in the infraorbital groove. After it gives that zygomatic branch, the nerve will form the infraorbital nerve and as it is traveling into the floor of the orbit, ultimately it's going to emerge from the maxillary bone about one centimeter below the inferior orbital rim through an opening which is called the inferior orbital opening. So as you can see over here, so this is this is the groove which I was talking about through which the inferior orbital fissure, this is the inferior orbital fissure and this is the groove in which the infraorbital nerve is going to travel and it's going to travel like this straight into the floor of the orbit and then come out through an opening which is present one centimeter below the uh, inferior orbital rim. Now there's a very important clinical point regarding the inferior orbital nerve or the inferior orbital uh, foramina that you can see over here, okay, through which the inferior orbital nerve is going to come out, okay. The thing is that the infraorbital nerve basically carries sensation from the lower eyelid, okay, from the cheek area, from the upper lip, from the upper teeth and the gingiva, gingiva region, right. So whenever there's a fracture of the floor of the orbit, Okay, which involves this area, which is uh, which is harboring the infraorbital nerve. The patient will have loss of sensation or paresthesias of the lower lid and the cheek because of the involvement of the inferior orbital nerve. So that was a clinical point, uh, important clinical point regarding the infraorbital nerve. The next set of foraminas are the ethmoidal foraminas. Now, the ethmoidal foraminas are actually located, if you see, along the frontozygomatic suture. So, this is the frontal bone. Okay, you can see over here, this is the frontal bone and this is the ethmoid bone. Sorry, I'll correct myself. It is the frontal ethmoidal suture. Okay, so this is the frontal bone, this is the ethmoidal bone and you can see a suture which is connecting the two and this is called a frontoethmoidal suture and along that frontoethmoidal suture you can see these two openings, one is anterior, one is posterior and therefore this is the anterior ethmoidal foramina and this is the posterior ethmoidal foramina. What are the contents that they uh, carry? through them is the anterior and posterior ethmoidal group of vessels and the nerves very simple now the question is what is the importance of these two uh, foramina the anterior and the posterior ethmoidal foramina number one is if you would remember from my video on anatomy of the orbit wall i told you that the ethmoidal bone is which is also called the thinnest bone or the lamina papyracea is present in the medial wall and forming the middle chunk of the medial wall of the orbit right and this ethmoidal bone is actually a part of the ethmoidal bone and i told you that this orbital plate of the ethmoidal bone is in very close approximation to the ethmoidal air group of sinuses right and since the bone is very thin this bone can easily allow the passage of infectious materials and neoplasm into the orbit and not just uh, the fact that the bone is thin but also basically it is the presence of these ethmoidal foramina, the anterior and posterior ethmoidal foramina, which allow the passage of microbial um, content or the microbes from the ethmoidal air sinus into the orbit through the foramina apart from that if you can see the ethmoidal bone is in close approximation to the cribriform plate and this is a very important landmark um, because this is the point where the nasal cavity and the orbital cavity is separated from the cranial cavity right so this also acts the ethmoidal uh, structures or the ethmoidal foramina act as a very important surgical landmark it is said that any surgery on the medial wall of the orbit should be limited up to the level of these ethmoidal foramina we should try not to approach above or not to manipulate the tissues above the level of the foramina because if you do so there are more chances of damage to the cribriform plate and an unintentional entering into the cranial vault so that's a very important surgical landmark so as i told you that the ethmoidal foramina can act as a conduit for infection from the nasal cavity or from the sinuses directly into the orbital cavity and it can form this kind of abscess uh, on the medial wall which is called a subperiosteal abscess
The fourth type of opening is the optic canal. As I told you that the canals, canal basically means it's not called a foramina if you would observe. It's not called a foramina because it's not just a simple opening like a superior orbital fissure or a inferior orbital fissure which are just acting as doors. However here this is not just an opening but an extended passage also and therefore this passage through, through which the optic nerve actually travels for some distance is called the optic canal now what are the structures which are passing through this optic canal it is the optic nerve along with the ophthalmic artery now one point that we need to remember over here is that the optic canal is a very tight structure and the optic nerve uh, passes through it along with the ophthalmic artery and therefore whenever there is trauma to the eyeball the forces of shock are actually transmitted to the area of the optic canal and can cause damage to the optic nerve. Such a damage to the optic nerve is called traumatic optic neuropathy. Now, if this trauma leads to any kind of fracture of the optic canal and causes a direct transaction of the optic nerve or a direct impingement by the bony fragment of the canal onto the optic nerve, it is called a direct injury of the optic nerve or the direct traumatic optic neuropathy. But sometimes what happens is that there might not be any fracture of the optic canal, there might not be any transaction of the optic, optic nerve, but still because of the blunt trauma, But because of the injury, what happens is that the optic nerve will actually develop optic nerve edema or there will be some sort of ischemia which will in turn leads to edema. So what happens is because of the limited space uh, between the optic canal, this nerve is also going to get swollen and its vascular supply is going to get compromised and that is called an indirect injury to the optic nerve which is the indirect traumatic optic neuropathy. Another thing which can happen is that sometimes the, as we know that the optic nerve has a very rich vascular supply. So what can happen is that the there can be a hematoma adjacent to the optic nerve sheath and that hematoma in turn can cause compression of the optic nerve and as it causes compression of the optic nerve, it will cause damage to the optic nerve fibers, right? And this is called the orbital compartment syndrome, which happens because of the increased pressure within the optic canal. At last, what is meant by the orbital apex? The orbital apex is an uh, apical area in the posterior aspect of the orbit where all the four walls of the orbit are actually converging, whether it is the superior wall, the inferior wall, the lateral and the medial wall, and they are actually converging uh, at the apex of the orbit. And the important structures which are present at the apex of the orbit is spe uh, specifically the canal and the fissures is the optic canal and the superior orbital fissure. This is very important for us to remember because we have clinical conditions like the superior orbital fissure syndrome and the orbital apex syndrome. So what is the difference between the SOF syndrome and the orbital apex syndrome? In the SOF syndrome, uh, what will happen is you will see the signs of uh, disease which will affect only the structures which are present in the superior orbital fissure. That means your uh, lacrimal nerve, the lacrimal nerve, the frontal nerve, the trochlear nerve which is the fourth cranial nerve will be affected. Apart from that third cranial nerve will be affected both the superior and the inferior division. The nasociliary branch will be affected. The sixth nerve will also get affected. However, the optic nerve will remain intact. The vision will not be affected. Whereas in orbital apex syndrome, both the optic canal structures and the superior orbital fissure structures are going to get affected. So apart from seeing all the efferent uh, problems, all the problems related to the third, fourth, sixth cranial nerve, apart from the V1 division of the trigeminal nerve, you're also going to see the problems related to the second cranial nerve that is the optic nerve so that's the basic difference between sof and orbital apex syndrome so that's all for today thank you and have a nice day